Great. Thank you so much. So uh, as is our custom, I'm going to ask you to signify your presence vocally. Sharon? Here. Thank you, Farah. Here. Alex? Here. Christine? Here. George? Here. Paul Bockelman? Present. Jennifer? Here. It's nice to see you, Jennifer. You too. And Austin Sarrett is here. Okay. Thank you. So we, we seem to have some minutes to approve. They uh, were not ready in time, so we'll do those next next okay. time. So for everybody there, when it says minutes from May 7th, they're not there. Okay. Item number three, town manager report. Mr. Bockelman. Um, so as you all know, we received one bid from uh, when we went out to bid. Um, it was significantly over budget if by 18 percent. Um, I have rejected that bid. And so uh, there is no bid on the project at this point in time. Thank you. Any questions for Paul Bockham? OK. Next is. Um, a uh, financial update, Jennifer. I don't have anything new to update since the last meeting. Do we have any invoices that we need to approve? Not at this meeting, no. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, item five, MBLC extension request. Um, yesterday, the Board of Trustees of the Jones Library um, voted uh, four in favor, one opposed, uh, one person recused um, uh, to avoid a conflict of interest, to request that the MBLC grant an extension uh, of its grant to the state. Uh, if the MBLC approves that extension request, our hope and intention would be to re put the project out for a rebid in um, in the fall in September. Our hope is that by rebidding the project, we will attract uh, other general contractors, and in attracting other general contractors, we hope. Uh, that we will get uh, bids which are um, in the range that we can afford. Since uh, it was very clear to the Board of Trustees and I think to the town manager that we could not afford uh, the amount that Fontaine bid. So uh, we wanted to bring this to you for your for discussion for questions um, about what the process would be going forward. Uh, if MBLC approves our uh, request, the question is, what if anything we might do uh, to the design of the library? Uh, one possibility is that we would do very little and we would basically rebid the project as it was put out to bid um, the first time. Um, there might have to be some kind of tweaking of things in order to make sure that we don't have to issue addenda as we go, as we go along again. Uh, but what that, what that would mean is that we would not have to engage in a lot of redesign work. Uh, it's not clear to me, though um, Ellen could speak to this, or maybe Tim could speak to this. It's not clear to me that a lot of redesign work will close the gap between what the Fontaine bid was and what we can afford, namely our project, our project budget. Um, so rather than doing a lot of redesign work uh, and still facing a substantial gap 
uh, it might make sense not to do that redesign work and to go out to rebid. Now, this is less of a concern for the JLBC, but I'll just report it. The trustees have also uh, are also going to be working on the fallback plan um, if the rebid process were not to work in bringing down the uh, general contractor's um, bid. So we're not going to sit still and wait uh, for uh, more time. Um, the hope would be we would rebid in September. We'd put it up for bid in September with a return in early November, I think. Uh, so that is that is that is where we are. That is what uh, what we were contemplating. What the board of trustees was contemplating. Okay, questions, thoughts, observations. Okay. Yeah, Pam. I was hoping other people would ask the questions. Um, since we're talking about rebidding, um, I would like to know what the rough cost would be for services between now and a rebid, reselection of contractor, all the the um, sub filed sub bids and what what will that cost over the next I guess three months, four months? But who has projected out that cost? That's one. Sure. And then then who pays for that? Sure. Uh Ellen, do you want to speak to the question of um what expenses we might incur between now and uh the time that we get G C bids in? Sure. Uh, good question, Pam. So the we'll have to do some work to rebid it. And the you know the question is, do we uh, approach it with uh, alternates? So if we took that approach, um, we would we would look we would be in the range about eighty to eighty to ninety thousand for repackaging uh, the documents. And someone brought it up the other day um, at the trustee meeting at. Uh, whichever meeting was Monday, I'm sorry, I get them confused about, you know, the question about all the, the information that went into the addendas that went out previously, all that stuff is already in the drawing. So none of that would have to get touched again. It's already incorporated. And just so we're clear. So the, the work would be in the 80 to $90,000 range for, for the redesign work. And then there'll be some money for the, for the uh, duration of bid. Another thirty to forty. Uh, it would be probably in the fifty to sixty range. Pam, did you have another? Did you have another question? Yeah, I mean that's essentially it. Okay, we, thank, th th thank you, Paul. Cost, yeah, thank you, Paul Barkelman. So, I guess for Ellen, if we wanted to minimize. The, absolutely minimize the cost. And suppose we just wanted to take exact, not exactly what we did, you know, incorporate the addendum into it. If the logic is we hit the market at the wrong time, we did not get the quantity of bids that we needed to, and the addendum were pro a problem. If we fix those three problems and then said, we don't want to redesign or do anything like that. And I'm just sort of speculating here is this one option. Could we go out? What, is there any cost involved? I mean, we have staff on hand that who could do some of that work, but is there any additional cost? And, you know, and I think um, <clears throat> that would just be a rebid the exact same project at a different time to address the market failure at the time when we did bid with re receiving mm -hmm. one bid. Yes, and that would, that would be very little cost. Paul, I, the cost would probably just be us meeting with the groups, whoever we had to meet with while we're repackaging that. But the it's, as I said, the addendum's already incorporated into the documents. That's done as we those were issued. So that it's not a heavy lift. There'd still be a cost for rebidding because that is work without, you know, answering RFIs because there will be some. Um, mm -hmm. 
so that was in the the I think the fifty to sixty thousand dollar range. But again, it depends how much how much work we actually do, how much work Tim teams will will do, you know. And, and we can sort that out and and try to lower that working with you, Paul. Okay. Uh, I, just follow, I just follow. Does that include you have to review filed sub bids as well? You have to go through that process yeah. again. Yes. Yep. And actually, last time at the Collier's group took a, uh, a the bulk of that work was with them. We were we were in the in the loop, but they did a, the bulk of the work. Thank you, Alan. Uh, Alex. Yeah, yes. Alan. I'm not sure if that is um, actually required to to go and and re. Um, certainly, if okay. you want to increase your bidding pool and potential, you, you would have you would need to do that, but. Um, I'm not sure it's required to go through that process again. So obviously that is a time consuming and, and labor intensive process. For the file sub bids? For filed sub bids and, um, and GCs, if you're going to re-pre-qualify the, the, the teams I think, for the, the, the potential bidders, yes, they you. I think let's just be clear and Pam, I apologize. Are you just talking this... about rebidding or are you talking about going through the pre-qualification process? No, I think I think Tim and Pam. Maybe I have the question me. wrong. Uh, yeah, let me just confirm. Pam, you're talking about the file sub bids only? No, I'm talking about if 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 the if it is rebid, do you have to go through, even if it's bid as as it was exactly, um, do you have to go through the process of reviewing and qualifying sub bidders again um or is it is it a brand new start or can you go back to the same same folks that that pre-qualified last time we can stick as tim's saying we can stick to the same pre-qualified group and if there are new new vendors new contractors you would presumably somebody would have to vet those as well we wouldn't have any new ones If we're, we're sticking with, the... with what we have, and I don't think, based on the discussion of not changing the, the scope of work, if we're limiting the scope of work changes to pretty much minor changes, we would not have to re pre qualify the, the bid, bidder pool. Um, if you wanted to add bidders more than what we currently have um, pre qualified, then you would need to go through that pre qualification process all over again. Okay, Alex Lefebvre. Thanks. So um, again, so for this committee's purpose, we're not voting. This is just more correct informational. And but at the end of the day, the trustees or Paul are making this decision. We're just I'm always trying to thread the needle of like you know questions to be asked versus like what's the role of this committee. Um, so uh, I mean, I guess. Is it in the purview of this committee to be talking about the cost? Because we're, sorry, this transition from like trustee to like just this committee, I'm trying to make sure I don't overstep and and go into areas that don't make sense for this group. So I'm just navigating. So I apologize. Um, I'm not I'm not entirely sure like what makes sense to ask and what doesn't. And, and maybe everything's okay. I don't know. So, Alex, it's a little hard for me to read your mind at this moment. So, no, no. I, well, okay. I, so, yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't know how to advise you. Um, <laughs> okay. the, 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 we are. So we, here, so here are the things I'm, I that are in my head, and then you can just be like that. That's for somebody, another group. So, um, to further up on Pam's question, so we talked about FAA, but I assume there's an additional cost for Colliers as well, or is that would that not, or is that included in what? No, there would be additional cost. Okay, so while we're fleshing out additional costs, what what do we have a sense of what that would be? So Thank we're you. looking at. We would have to talk about the scope so we can try and, you know, minimize uh, what it could be. Currently, I think our our monthly billing is about um, just under eleven thousand dollars. But would you be engaging? Uh, in we'd also have potential costs for a bid po or a bid hosting service uh, that was pretty minimal. That was, um, I think, we just saw an invoice um, 
or we will be getting an invoice before you at the next meeting. Uh, it was, I think, $1,000 or $1,100. Tim it, faded up there a little bit. Yep, Alex. Yeah, so I guess is it, I mean, where with FAA, you know, the, the work level, like the expected, like will, will you be doing the same level of work on a monthly basis to warrant the same fee? And I guess that's part of the conversations that'll be had. Correct. Line. So I guess my other question is, you know, part of the reason why yeah. the costs on this project have gone up so much is because of delays due to various and sundry things that have occurred over the last 12 years. And so adding another delay, I mean, do, do we have any sense of how much additional, so we send it out to rebid, we hope that it's more competitive, but then we're also going to see further escalation because we're going out further in time. And so do we have a sense of what that is and, you know? Uh, yeah, I would, I would say that if you're talking about a six month extension, you could expect to see about um, eight hundred thousand to a million dollars in escalation costs. You know, if you're saying that a year's escalation would be around six percent, um, that three uh, percent of just a round number of forty million dollars is one point two million. So, you know, for a little bit under six months, you know, certainly that would help. But uh, I think as a as a range, um, it would be good to stay eight hundred thousand to one point two million. And and the timing that we've selected, the six month timing, is based on when we think will be the most favorable time in terms of number of bidder. I mean, I'm assuming all these sort of calculations have been done behind the scenes, and we've chosen what we've chosen because it's the timing that makes the most sense. Um, in terms of the most yeah, coming out of the summer months, the contractors are very busy. Um, and then as they go into the fall, they're often looking for something to carry them into uh, or begin in the winter and really hit the ground running in the spring. Um, you know, but you just never know with what other projects are out there. Um, you know, you just, um, we're just trying to play the odds. Okay. I, I see Christine's got a hand up, so I'll. Are you all set, Alex? I, yeah, I think so. I'm. Good. Yeah, Christine. Thank you, Christine. Um, yeah, I heard um, Austin. You mentioned kind of no um, veing, no looking at the design and and reducing costs. Then I'm also hearing not to do a new prequal and bring new players to the table. So we've got these six that were there, one of them bid. They all know that our budget is 36 something mil and five chose not to bid. So by doing nothing with our scope and keeping with the same players, I fear that that would not, that would be risky to go into the fall that way, wanting this to move forward. So I'm just expanding the talk here. Why are we not thinking, because it is, we went over 18%, that's significant. And we just talked about escalation as the months go on. So I thought there would be a few things in play. We would want to do a little bit of everything that's in our control, relook at the uh, CD and reduce some things, be it, um, and how much work is it to redo the qualification? I know we have a tight timeline here, um, but bringing other op other GCs or you know builders into the to the scope. Do you have particular ideas, uh, Christine, that you want to share about things that, uh, again, just at a general level? that you think uh, would be good to try to value engineer at this point? Well, first off, before I would suggest anything, yeah. I also am looking at estimates that were done last November. Yeah. We were just told every six months, everything shifts again. Is there any talk, this was gonna be my follow-up, any talk of should we do another estimate and get another snapshot of what things are costing right now that would give us a better idea of what our numbers are. Now, 
in normal circumstances, you cut the size of the building. And yep. if that's not an option at all here, yes, it is much more difficult. And we also did do some significant um, right. value engineering earlier. But of course, there's always other things to cut. And uh, do I think we could cut $7 million? No. Do I think even four would be tough? But I'm just saying don't. I thought we would need to look at multiple we got to try to look at everything to adjust every little thing so that we can make this work in the fall. Meaning, do we need more con, you know, more uh, bidders? Um, and can we reduce costs? Because they already know, they already knew what our budget was and they just chose not to, they could have been busy. They could have been had other jobs or whatever, but they knew what the number was that they were trying. We, we would have hoped to have multiple bids all yeah. under our budget and we didn't we had one that's way out so anyways i just want to look at everything we can even if it's going to be some hard work and cost a little bit more money you know we're talking 50k and this that's going to be really small numbers in the large scheme of everything so i just was wondering as i was listening to the conversation and and i'm still hanging out there do we need another estimate yeah so let me just say this um, uh, to uh, to engage in a significant value engineering exercise uh, with the idea of doing something significant to reduce the cost is a costly activity. So part of what I think we all need to think about is uh if we if we could save seven million dollars by value engineering presumably we would be you know in a position where we look at the cost and we say it might actually be worth it the question is whether or not the value engineering uh would save us enough in light of the cost that we would have to pay to do it that we would end up saying yeah, this is actually a good investment of more more design time more architect time more engineering time so uh that's what's in this that's that's what's in the scale that's why i asked you and again it's not for you in particular right it's all of us uh what, what are we what are we thinking about so to save um how much would how much would we have to invest so i don't know whether that's 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 helpful christine or is it um still too general because once if we say value engineering then we've got to get into the process we've got to work with our architects we're going to be doing redesign and so i'm just just thinking out loud about uh, the kind of cost benefit of doing that. Can I still speak? Oh yeah, of course. Um, I I think some things that cut are going to require more, and this is where Ellen can speak on. Will sure. be more intensive on them and redoing the documentation. Um, but sometimes switching out materials, um, you know, some, you got to look at the big ticket items, you know, which would be the mechanical and the electrical. Um, you know, I know we have important sustainability issues in there, but, you know, you have to look at the the big ticket items. And like I said, I don't think we can cut 7 million or anywhere near that. But if we're not going to redo the prequal or get more players on board for bid possibilities, you know, we, I know a, there's a lot of like people forecast, like why that happened, but we don't want the same thing to happen again. They sure. saw, it's all about them making profit too. This is, you know, we're worried about our money, but whoever comes and builds this, everybody wants to, they know their profit margins or not their profit margins. And I don't know, I, I know we're trying to keep the work to a minimum and our cost to a minimum, but I don't want to sort of spite our face by not doing anything. It also shows a 
an intent, like it shows our, that we're willing to cut some things too, and not just be like, we want what we want, even though we can't afford it. Can we cut some things and reduce it? I mean, it would even be helpful to cut one, two million dollars off. That would be helpful, especially after we just heard about escalation. I think not, I think we still need to look into the effort. I think we still need to have a VE meeting and go through items, listen to our designers, maybe have an estimator there who actually like does this all the time and can tell us like, well, can we do cut this? And oh, that wouldn't really save any money, but this would. We're not experts in this, but we need to listen to the experts. So I'm just throwing it out there. Okay. Thank you. Alex Lefebvre. So I'm hearing two really different things, and I guess I'm trying to navigate which which is the more accurate of the statement. So I think most people like to operate in the world of having as much information as possible so that you can make the best informed decision. And I think the idea of getting an updated cost estimate and the idea of sitting down with the architects and sitting down with the cost you know, estimator and value engineering all sounds really good. And I'm super in favor of that if that's a possibility, but you know, I'm hearing Austin say that it's cost prohibitive and I'm hearing Christine say that it's like $50,000. And so I don't know if Ellen and Tim or Bob or someone can give a little more information about, you know, what we're talking about. And, you know, are, are we talking about spending a couple hundred thousand dollars to get to an end where we've already been told potentially, and I don't know that this is the answer, we've already been told we're not going to be able to do anything. You know what I mean? Like, I don't want to, I don't want to go through an exercise because it feels good to run through an exercise. And then we just spend a bunch of money and that doesn't make sense to me. Um, but at the same time, if there is value to doing the exercise, then we should do it. And I just, I don't, I don't know where that balance is because I don't know what the numbers are. Okay. Ellen, do you want to, uh, do you want to speak to these, this question about the trade-off uh, of the costs of design and redesign uh, of a value engineering exercise, and could we could we talk a little bit about bidding alternatives um, as a alternative to a value engineering exercise at this time? Yes. So, <clears throat> part, so what would what our cost would be to evaluate the different um, VE items that you would want to consider? We'd have to have a meeting with you and, and talk those through. Is it mechanical? Is it no CLT? Is it no new windows in the library? Is it no flooring? I, we don't know what what you guys would would like us to explore. So that would be the first step going down that VE. Um, listen, I, I think if we did that, Christine, you're right. We should have a cost estimator there with us. <clears throat> um, the other way that we have done on on other jobs, just not so much for funding all the time. It's sometimes people just want to just get a, a gut check on the cost of something would be to do alternates. So an alternate would be, uh, for instance, we do know that the, there's significant money in in the existing building. Um, and there's significant money and I don't know what else, just mean, um, maybe not, let me take an easier example. The existing windows, right? We are calling out to replace the sash, right? With insulated glass, it's gonna be a great window. An alternate would be not to do that, but just to repair the existing um, windows, right? Not the most, uh, maybe not the most, energy efficient thing, but it would be an improvement to what is there. So we would we we would uh, put some documents together uh, and have that as an ad alternate. And we could pick some other, we, it could be, I don't know, landscape or anything. We can make a list of these alternates. We would have to do some documentation drawings to uh, to capture what the scope of those alternates. And that would be those would be included with the bid. So it, you'd, and you, the, the trick to this is you have to take them in order they're listed. So you can't just say, oh, I, I want to, I want to keep the, I want to keep the, I want to keep the landscape and I, I 
I don't want to do the landscape. So you, it's a tricky way to, to do it, but it can be done. And we actually had proposed that we had mentioned that in a conversation with Sharon, that that is a way uh, to capture some savings because you would, you would have a real number then, right? You'd have a real number from a contractor. So we, we, again, but we would, we would want to get together with, uh, folks and figure out which exactly ones that this group would, the group would want to entertain. We have a few ideas, um, but, you know, we'd like to work with folks to figure that out. Thank you, Ellen. Pam? Thank you. Um, it occurred to me that an easy target is the fixtures, furnishings, and equipment and I would be adamantly opposed to using those as value engineering items because uh, the library would have to turn around immediately and and uh, ask the town for capital funding to replace all of the material that didn't come out of you know that was in this budget. Um, I I'm going to bring up again, and I'm I'm looking at Paul Bockelman as I say it, but I think. Um, just from the perspective of what was discussed last night at the town council meeting, that there is interest in um, not having an extension of bid cost the town. And again, you all have been more engaged in the memorandum of, of agreement between the town and the trustees, but I would be very supportive of the trustees taking on the burden of of any and all of the costs, whether it's the escalation pricing and or the services required. I think it's I think it would be a good faith effort to have the trustees cover these kinds of costs if we do go forward to a rebid. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. Other thoughts. Alex. Yeah, I just want to respond to Pam's comment. And uh, in my many, many years on the JCPC, as I'm constantly doing, is reminding people that the library is a town department. And we are very, very fortunate as a town that somebody at some point provided an endowment to offset the cost for the town to run a library. And it's easy to forget that and feel like the endowment's sort of this separate nonprofit entity that has nothing to do with the town. Um, and so we don't ask, you know, the school <laughs> to go out and do a PGO drive, right, for difference in costs. And so I think, I think the library has been very responsible in trying to help offset the cost to the town, but I just want to remind people that the town is part of the library. These are town employees. The computers that get replaced every couple of years are part of the town capital budget. So I, I think we do ourselves a disservice when we start um, putting forth the idea that the library is separate from the town and we try to push costs back on a different town department. Thank you. Uh, Christine? Um, so I'm just trying to define three things that I'm hoping for an answer on Good. Um, three. Things. It's about, um, so we're not tripping over dollars to pick up dimes here. There's big project, big money. We went 18% over. So how do we get a win in the fall? And it would be, do we need an estimate? How much would that cost? Do we need one or two? Like we've been doing before, um, the next would be, are we going to prequal and reopen it again or not? And how much does that cost? Like how much will it, our OPM and our designers and how much, you know, maybe the town can pick up some of it, uh, some of the work, but that would be a cost. And then, and this is a little harder for Ellen and them, but, you know, a range of what it would cost to VE. And I think, Ellen, you kind of know what some of these things would be that we would be looking at in our head. And maybe if you could just provide a range of like, we do no VE and how much of your services it would cost. 
And if we had some slight changes or if we had, because I know it's how many pages you're touching and all that, and just a range. And then we would have some numbers and then we can start getting into who's going to pay for it. But, you know, I don't want us to just shut down right now on hundreds of thousand, you know, even if it's a couple of hundred thousand, the 50 earlier I was talking about, if that's like prequal or whatever additional costs, but if get those costs in kind of in baskets, and then we can better avow and figure out what we can do, because I, I don't think we can just throw the same thing out there and expect necessarily a better $7 million less outcome. Thank you. Okay. Um, Alex? Yeah, thanks. Sorry, something Christine said just triggered for me. I guess one thing that would be helpful as we're having this conversation is to not have it in a vacuum. So the Friends of the Jones Library have done incredible work around fundraising and around specific grants, whether they're state, federal, you know, et cetera. And um, a lot of those grants are very specific in terms of what they do. And so... Um, I guess it would be important for this group to understand that if we decide, you know, not to do X or not to do Y, are we jeopardizing, you know, a million dollar, you know, uh, you know, gift or or grant? And so I, I just, again, I think it's really easy when you are in a vacuum to sort of think about all these ideas, but I think it's really important for us to understand the impacts of of these things, um, which I don't know. I just put it out there. Okay. So uh, let's see whether we can get some clarification on pre-qualification. We have six general contractors who were pre-qualified. So my first question is, uh, just to write, Christine, just to try to be clear about this, are we, for uh, for any reason, limited to those six contractors, or could we go through another pre-qualification process? Uh, Tim, uh, Ellen, yeah, I, Bob, I, you, Bob. I, I think you are able to go through another pre-qualification process. Um, you're not, I don't think you're required to, um, based on not really changing the scope of the project. If you were to significantly change the scope of the project, you would definitely have to go through the pre-qualification process over again. Um, you know, the number of GCs that you uh, pre-qualify, typically your pre-qualification is done uh, towards the end of design, but um, you know, it, 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 there's, a, there's a lag between when you put out your request for qualifications and you go through that process and bids are actually received. And sometimes firms receive uh, awards uh, in between. And so then they, they don't necessarily go after the project or, um, you know, doesn't that now doesn't fit in their schedule. So there's, there's a variety of reasons why people might pre-qual for a project and then not bid it. Um, we did go out and tried to um, survey from the firms that, that were pre-qualified that didn't bid and for what reasons. Um, we'll say roughly half of them are from a local, relatively local, and, and the other half are further east. Um, but they all had different reasons why they, they did not bid, You know whether it was additional work or um, the, the bid, the, the value of the project started to get up uh, in the neighborhood where their aggregate bond was would be over their aggregate bonding and the limit because of the other work that they have currently. Um, so things can change. Um, certainly, if we were to go back out, there's no guarantee that we would even get six, um, but we, we potentially could get more. It just depends upon um, how busy people are. Uh, there's a, there is a lot of work out there. Yeah, Bob Parent. Um I'd like to share just a little bit of, of information where we are relative to the Fort River School Project, um, because we are actually in nearing the end of the pre-qualification process. I, I can't share names yet until we get all the way through the process, but we're anticipating uh, general contractors, three to four general contractors to be pre-qualified, at least three, maybe four being on the same list that we have for the Jones Library. So just by comparison on a project that's not quite twice the size and and that is a factor because one of the pre-qualified general contractors on jones library uh would not be able to be pre-qualified on 
Fort River due to the size of the project. David Sullivan, um, a very capable local firm, but they don't meet the, you know, the the magnitude of projects. But bottom line is we're looking at a very similar list of pre-qualified firms and not many more, in fact, possibly less than on Jones Library. And Bob, just to make sure that we, um, what, if any, costs are incurred in additional pre-qualification? It would typically, I think, as Alan had mentioned previously in the prior round in the Jones Library, the heavy lifting was really done by Collier's. Mm -hmm. um, so it would be the Collier's time uh, that uh, would be incurred if we were to go through the pre-qualification process again. And it is probably one of the more labor intensive pieces of the bidding phase. Can you put a number on it? Uh, I don't really want to speak for Collier's. I'd, I'd rather them speak to it. Tim? Yeah, I, I would say it's, it's, you know, for that period, it would be maybe double what we typically would charge on a uh, currently receiving because it's kind of mm -hmm. uh, our, our ebb and flow of a, of a whole project versus, look, we've got two months where we're going to be working on this. So that portion is 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 probably um, I, I, I'm just spitballing here. So I'd have to run some numbers, but I would say it's probably double what we would typically bill in a typical month. Okay. Thank you, Paul. Did you want to say something? Yeah. So just I want to just clarify. Um, so we have six pre-qualified. Um, we don't know. I, I don't know what the total universe of potential bidders are. I mean, GCs are maybe it's seven, maybe it's a hundred. I don't know, but six seem to be. You know, and and if it's there's a cost to try to expand that, but it it, it might not. So the question is 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 it worth the time to pre, to expand the prequel? And then the question to Bob is, since the jo the um, school is going out, if will the school eliminate any of the people any of the firms that are since these projects are now going to be lined up <laughs> side by side um we don't want to damage either project but do you anticipate any conflict with the schools because of the the two bit projects going out sort of at similar times it's always a dynamic project uh, process the school project we anticipate is getting out to bid a couple of months um in advance of, of the date that we're looking at possibly for the jones library so they wouldn't be bidding at the same time so in theory if you had a contractor that was nearing their capacity or nearing their bonding limit and they were successful in winning the fort rivers project they might be less inclined to bid for jones uh, for the jones library project on the other hand you know, contractors are always finishing projects. And as they finish a project, you know, it leaves a void and they, they pick up additional capacity. So it's it's really almost a contractor by contractor type of process in terms of what their workload looks like, what they win, what they're finishing up and how that fits into their their manpower capabilities as well as their financial capabilities. Thank you. Ella, did you want to say anything at this point? Ellen? Austin. Sorry, I'm not hearing Ellen. Uh, Christine. I just had a short little question. Um, does the prequal process or have an expiration date? I'd have to check with the um, AG's office on that just to get a ruling. Um, typically, within a one-year period, if um, you if a project were to you go through the pre-qualification process and you didn't go out to bid, um, my experience has been if within a year or so you're you're still good, you don't have to go through the pre-qualification process. Um, once you get beyond that, the, what what changes is um, potentially their uh, financial status, how they're doing, what other projects they have. Um, so that's part of the pre-qualification process. Um, what won't change necessarily is, you know, their past work and previous accomplishments, um, but their team that you're going to be using um, that they're required to submit resumes on may change. So um, usually it's about a year, I would say. Could you get confirmation on that from the AG for us just to... Absolutely. Thank you. 
Ellen, are you back? So Ellen seems to be frozen. Can you hear Joseph? me? Yes, can you, you hear me now? I'm hearing you breaking up. Um, I was going to try to get an answer to the question about an estimate. Uh, I don't know whether Josephine or Tim, you can speak to the question about would it make sense to get to go through another estimation process? Uh, and if, well, and so what the cost would be? Yeah, we'd have to take a look and get um, a cost, whether you did one estimate or two. Um, and I'd have to take a look at what we were spending um, for the previous ones. But um, around for a ballpark, about $10,000 per estimator if they were to go through this again, um, especially if we reuse the same ones if they're familiar with the project and the, um, and the details. So they might be able to do it a little, a little quicker, but whether to do it or not, we did discuss that internally. Um, and the two estimators felt that because the filed sub bid numbers came in on target, you know, some over, some below, but relatively as a as an aggregate that came in on target, they felt that their estimate was was accurate, and that the cost uh, overage at um, GC bid day was really due to the GC and other aspects, not necessarily the um, what the market would would show if we were to go through a re-estimate. So we didn't know that it was really worthwhile um, at this point without really anything changing. Um, to go through that process. And it, can I say one? I'm sorry, my Wi-Fi was crazy. Not a um, word. Not a word. The, th the thing that I was trying to ask is what, Tim, do you recall, what's the duration of the pre-call? Well, you have to advertise, put it out there for two weeks, then receive their submissions, um, then going through those. So you're probably talking five to six weeks at, at the minimum. Five to six weeks. So I, what I'm just, I, I think we should put it into perspective, looking at the date we're trying to hit. And yep. Christine, that was one of the things we were evaluating when we were talking about what should we do. Um, and so some of the things can be done in parallel. You know, we could get an estimate done if, you know, it, 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 during the prequal. Um, we, so there, there's some parallel, but I, I think it's really important for us to hit that mid-September date. Once we start getting away from that, we're going to be a little bit more at risk um, with, with the interest part. You know, who's going to be interested? All right. Paul? I guess with the um, estimate, I don't know what we would do with that information. If right. we if the estimate came in, is that going to inform a decision that we've already made? Because uh, um, if it's really low or really high, I don't know if we change our behavior based on the estimate. So um, I'd be open to that conversation. Right. Alex? Um, yeah, I would just echo what Paul said, especially in light of if the two cost estimators don't feel like they're going to do anything differently because of the sub bids, that it doesn't seem like a good use of funds to me. But right. um, relative to the, the school project, I guess, and I don't know well enough how um, the pre-qualification works. So if we decide to engage in another pre-qualification are the the contractors who are already pre-qualified stay pre-qualified and it or does it sort of reset the slate and i'm i'm thinking about right like if the school's working in tandem and slightly ahead of us you know i, I just i guess i want to make sure that that it it makes sense and it's working and we're not i don't know eliminating con gcs because we're reopening the process again and it seems and maybe i'm being naive that they are two very large projects, the school much bigger than the other, and GCs are probably gonna to gravitate to one or the other based on what they've got in the pipeline and and what they're best equipped to do. Um, but that could be a, a naive based on zero experience, <laughs> but that's what it seems like to me. Um, but I guess I just wanna be thoughtful about pre-qualifications and GCs knowing that we have these two big projects and making sure we're coordinating in a way that makes the most sense for the town. You, you know, uh, Alex, we asked, we had that conversation with the estimators, right? And they said immediately, these are two different projects, right? The school is new ground up. 
easy peasy, right? So you're going to get, you're going to, that's going to attract a certain kind of contractor. And ours is, is not easy peasy. It's historic, right? It's a tight site, but it's a wonderful building that takes a certain amount of um, quality contractor. So there's going to be overlap by some contractors, but you'll get some contractors that won't even look at the, at the library because of the complexity. Okay. Other, Christine. So I'm, I'm thinking about Paul's comment about why do an estimate. And, um, you know, I look at the estimates we have from last November um, and would be almost bidding, you know, almost a year later. And it, by the skin of our teeth, came in under our budget of the $36 million. So we also heard earlier from our OPM that even in the next four or five months, prices will go up. So maybe the known is, yes, the estimates will be higher. How much higher, we don't know. But maybe that's what we have to talk about. Or Paul, what are you thinking in your head? Like, what if it just came in at 37? Is that going to make us feel, okay, we're okay. We don't have to do a lot of VE. And, and hopefully one of these contractors will bite and put in a bid that's around that cost. Um, because they would know what it, anyways, and then, or it's, I, I don't think it would be 7 million high, but let's just say it's 4 million high. So what, what do we do? Or if we knew that right now, what are the actions we should be doing to make this a win when we go to bid it again? There are limited things that we can do, Christine. There's a limited universe. Uh, we can tr we can try to do we can try to do value engineering activities. Um, I I I I've not heard and you've not suggested that a value engineering activity is gonna is gonna solve our problem. Um, so, uh, to do the value engineering activity is gonna cost us money. So I think that's the and we're we're in a relatively want to be out to bid again in September. So I think those are the those are the things that we're that we have to figure out. I mean, you want to do a value engineering activity, it's going to be it's going to be going to require us to do some investment in it. And we can certainly ask Ellen and FAA to come back and say, here are the different things that you could value engineer and save significant money. And here's what the cost would, here's what the cost would be. Sharon. Yeah, so I, I think what we're looking at is everything that you're saying, Christine, but kind of in reverse. <clears throat> in order to lessen the risk, um, the town would like to, us to spend as little money as possible now over the summer. And so, um, Rebidding in September, but using alternates as as a way to cut back a little bit, and then we would get the bid ba bids back. And then, as you said, you were you hit the nail on the head. So, is two million too high? Is four million too high? It would be at that point where we would sit back and say, okay, we have a solid cost. Now we're two million over, and now we need to figure out what to do. So I I think that's the thinking right now. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, Christine, before coming back to you, Pam. Thank you. Um, one thing that I'm not I'm not overly familiar with, but CM at risk is another approach to uh, contracting. Having the having the general contractor, was there any discussion about CM at risk? Ellen, Tim. Well, a CM at risk, um, <coughs> the value in bringing in a CM at risk is that they're part of the team during design. Um, at this point, we're pretty much through design. Yeah, we may want to make some tweaks, but the design is essentially done. So that added value you're not getting by going with a CM. Um, a CMs are traditionally more expensive. Um, certainly on renovation projects and, and messier projects as far as logistics, um, it, it's worthwhile because you don't have to have everything documented 100%. Um, you know, there, there's 
the CM kind of helps with that. With the GC, you have to have everything documented. And if you don't show it on the drawings, they didn't did it, and they're, therefore they didn't include it, and you'll get a, a, a change order for it. But um, I don't see the value at this point of switching to a CM at risk because the design is complete, essentially. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. Pam, did that answer your question, Pam? It does answer my question. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much. Christine? Okay, so I hear some saying no estimate. Sharon was sort of like in reverse, so we would maybe do an estimate. And then from that, we would see where the market is and what this building is actually going to cost and then whether or not we would VE. Um, I just want to bring back to if this was a standard project and the MBLA, uh, MBLC didn't have its set of rules, the first thing you just do is shrink the building. Mm -hmm. And you can do that in ways that is not super costly and we don't have that option, but that would be normally the first thing you would do. There are still areas we could VE and some of them will be very unpopular, but it's about getting this built and not getting stuck on the shiny little things that we all want. Another area, I, I don't wanna get this into like an actual list of things, but something else is sometimes if you can't shrink the building, you would look at not finishing parts of the building, mm -hmm. um, which is something else we could talk about. But I just want to have a plan at the end of this meeting. What, what are we going to go do? Are we going to get an estimate? We don't have to decide on the prequal, but maybe it sounds like some more investigation needs to happen into the market, into the local and you know regional um, contractors and looking at, I already know there's jobs being awarded around the state and some of these people are on that. So we need information and I think so, we need a tighter yeah, plan. Yeah, I think we, I think we have some information and I think we can agree on information that we need. So the difficulty of with the general contractor is that general contractor, it's not a fixed thing, in, as you, you know much better than I do, it's not a fixed point in time. So the idea of we need to know the general contractors, we, we may not be able to know the general contractors because people will be finishing things, people will be bidding on things, those bids will not come through. Here's what I think we have, we've been talking about. Um, I hope this would be helpful, but again, if it isn't, Let's get Ellen to uh, come with a, here, here's some things that you could value engineer and save significant amounts of funds. Give us a list. And then we'll have a sense of what it is that we could, what is that we could do if we go the value engineering route. Uh, that seems to me to be right, what you were asking for before. And then we have a sense of what the cost savings could be if we did X, Y, or Z, and what it would cost us to do those to do those things. Now, between now and the time that MBLC needs to decide on whether we get an extension, we, we don't have to make any commitments one way or, one way or another on the, these questions. So is that would that be an appropriate thing to do as a next step? Ellen, come back to the JLBC with a list of, here are things that we could value engineer. Um, here's what the cost save, you know, the cost savings might be, and here's what it would cost to do the redesign work. Are people- Yes, we can do that. Awesome. Okay, Paul Bockelman. So, and I guess the only condition on that would be we comply with, with the MBLC requirements, period. Like anything else could be on the table, but as long as we meet the program, that, that's the big grant we care about. Well, I think the broader point is, I think that's true, but I think the broader point is we also want to make sure that we're not going to do anything that's going to sacrifice a million dollars from NEH or a million dollars from someplace else. So yes. Um, okay. Anything else anybody wants to say at this point? Okay. 
So uh, the next item on the agenda is correspondence. I don't know of any. The next item is topics not anticipated. I don't know of any. Uh, we have uh, some attendees. So we now have a chance for public comment. Any member of the public wishing to make a comment if they would raise their virtual if they would raise their virtual hand. Okay, I'm going to ask that we now take the five uh, now of five people who have raised their hands for public comment. Uh, there's a six. Okay, let's leave it to the six. Um, I'd ask each of you, please, insofar as you are able to make your comments um, as succinctly as possible and to recall, remember that we will not be going back. We won't not be having a back and forth about your, your comments, though so eager, eager to hear what you have to say. So first, Ken Rosenthal. Ken. Thank you, Austin. I'm disappointed that there, there is a voice missing from this meeting, and that is the voice of your treasurer, Bob Pan, who has made a suggestion that I wish would move to the table so that you could consider it seriously, which is to recognize <clears throat> that you're not going to be able to, to, to build the project as it's designed. You're not going to get bids that the town and you together can afford and that you need to accept the fact that you have a wonderful library with a 30-year-old edition which can remain in place and now spend what research investment money you might be expending on how to make the renovations and improvements to the existing facility without tearing down the 30-year-old edition sure. and trying to rebuild it. It's not my voice that will tell you all this, although I've said this before, but it's your own treasurer, Bob Pam, who has said so. And I hope you turn to him and ask him to go into some detail so that you have another way forward. Thank you, sure. Austin, for listening to me. Thank you. Thanks. And this is just a point of information. Uh, the Board of Trustees was really greatly informed by Bob Pam on two different occasions uh, and voted four to one to move forward with the request to the MBLC. That's just a point of information. Uh, Jeff, Jeff Lee. Hi, I'm Jeff Lee from South Amherst. Uh, I have to say, it seems like this committee sometimes considers town funds to be like play money. Um, you're talking about investing another $150,000 in design fees to extend the project six more months, 60,000 more maybe to Collier's. Um, <laughs> $200,000 is not a small amount of money. 50,000 is not a small amount of money. It's an educator's salary. Um, it's, it's very disheartening to hear you be that glib about it. Um, I'd also disagree with the contention that the library is just another town department. There are some major differences. No other town department has uh, a fundraising arm like the Friends of the Jones Library and the Capital Campaign. Um, no other department has a $9 million endowment. Um, you also get a healthy chunk of state aid every year. So it's, it's you should be more uh, sincere in explaining those differences. Right. And I'd also say that, in my view, the MBLC grant has been like a ball and chain on this project, and it's caused us to waste a lot of time, waste a lot of money, and build a library that's much bigger than what we truly need. So I would hope you would consider that. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, Bob Pam. Uh, I had Bob, but there he is, Bob Pam. Okay, um, thank you. Um... As you can tell, I'm getting involved in this in ways that I have not typically been involved before. Um, <clears throat> the architects have prepared a plan. The plan um, 
has virtues and faults. That's not an issue here. The question is, do we go forward? Um, let us assume that we went forward for six more months. Um, the only way that you can actually at that point do value engineering is if that was put in as alternates. Because once the bids come in, you're not going to then start redesigning the building. You're not going to start changing the way it's built. So, you know, the only way to do that would be as a series of alternates. Um, otherwise, you're into change orders, which are going to just create havoc on the project and its costs. Um, Think about what are the major cost savings that are possible within the existing design. Um, there are only a couple that are large enough to make a difference. Uh, landscaping, uh, we have chosen to go with a $2 million version of that. That is, from my perspective, way more than, than is appropriate. Um, if that were changed, then there might be a savings uh, of up to a million dollars. I don't know what the numbers would be. Um, on the north side of the building, the choice that was made by the architects, which has never been questioned, is, is that uh, floor to ceiling windows, which are the most expensive way to, to uh, fenestrate a building, uh, has always seemed to me to be a little strange, given that the north wind is cold. Uh, we're in New England. Uh, if that was going to be done somewhat differently, then there might be some real savings. Uh, it is also clear that, you know, the book sorter has been part of the design from the beginning. There has been questions about it. I'm not going to get into that argument. Um, but the heart of it is that one way or another, you can imagine a couple of million dollars coming off of this. And if you don't imagine that the, that the GC is going to now suddenly say, oh, I really made a mistake, I'm going to take $5 million off of the price, then you're still looking at a price which is substantially higher than where we were um, a year ago, or at least thought we were. Um, and then that then leads to the other question, which is, how does that get paid for? And the decision of the town has been very clear. It will not go up. The uh, decision of the MBLC has been, we've already given um, a 10% boost because of COVID. I don't see that going up. So the question is, if what has been $7 million in net proceeds from fundraising is now going to be 12 or 14 million, um, is that feasible? And I will tell you that my judgment of that is that it is not feasible. And so um, we can talk about how to do other things with the design and how to deal with uh, improving it in one way or another. But the reality is from my perspective that what you're looking at is destructive of the ability of the library to function. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Uh, next, I see Rebecca Nordstrom. Hi, um, I'm Rebecca Nordstrom. I live at 39 Dana Street, and I just wanted to express my support for trying again uh, for new bids in the fall for all the reasons that were expressed at yesterday's um, library trustee meeting. Um, I understand as I'm listening today that there are costs uh, involved in this delay, but I also feel that they seem relatively small compared to the scope of the entire project. And um, I would really love to see the project still move forward. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Okay, next, uh, Kelly Irwin. Hi, Kelly Irwin, South Amherst. Um, I want to thank Bob Pam for his um, careful analysis of some of the options we have for value engineering. And I'm sure we um, will consider those. It seems like you all are doing a really good, thorough job of figuring out all the options for addressing our 
overage and costs. I wish that some of the other citizens who are very good at um, keeping track of numbers and calculating prices would jump in and help us figure out how to build the library instead of continuing to tell us why we can't do it. Um, please know that the friends of the library are behind you and we are with the town manager and we will do whatever we can to help you uh, take this to the finish line. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Okay, the last in public comment uh, is Kent, Kent Ferber. Thank you, Austin. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. I, as I did with the library trustees, I urge you to pursue every available means to find a way to get this project to work. Um, they, and the, and the, the, first of all, I disagree entirely with the possibility that there is no way forward. I think there are lots of different combinations of fundraising, uh, cost cutting, changing the project, and uh, uh, additional fundraising and the use of the endowment, judicious use of the endowment that would, that would make it possible to go forward. And the reason I suggest that you pursue all of these at this point is because the alternative would clearly not be responsible. It, whatever you might spend in the short run to pursue this project will be insignificant in comparison to what we will spend on the alternative. The, the history of this town is absolutely crystal clear. I can predict that if the alternative is selected, and the project is abandoned, 10 years from now, some set of library trustees, town councilors, and town administrators will be in the same distress as you are in now, scratching their heads, wondering what we were thinking, trying to figure out how to find the money to fix problems we left them that were not only avoidable, but also made considerably worse by having spent more in order to have tried to avoid them. We're now suffering the results of Amherst singularly unhealthy habit of, of avoiding its physical plant responsibilities by deferring them for someone else to solve. It's time to use whatever means at our disposal and only when all those are used and no solution is found should we, should we be choosing the, the significantly less healthy alternative. Even during the 10 years that, that might, the, the alternative might be in place, it would be an embarrassing failure uh, to respond to the clearly expressed desires of the citizens of the town for the kind of community center they want their library to provide. The town clearly wants this project. Whatever short-term expenditures and belt tightening might be required to make the project move forward will be completely forgotten 10 years from now, leaving our successors not the heap of problems we have inherited, but a healthy, vibrant institution playing a major role in defining the heart and soul of our unique town that our citizens want. That's the legacy we would hope, to, the friends and I would hope to leave. We hope you share that and are willing to help pull us, pull out all the stops to achieve it without throwing in the towel at this point. Thank you very much for your work for the library. Thank you, Ken. Okay, there's one person. This is the last public comment I see someone named Cameron. And then we're going to stop it after Cameron. Hello. Actually, I'm using my son's phone. This is Carol Gray. Hey, Carol. Um, hi. So I'm urging insanity and stop throwing good money after bad. This project is so spun out of control that it's it's a huge cost for the town. Rewind all this. Pretend this you haven't been working on this project for years, your particular group. Pretend there's a fictitious town that's going to lay off about 20 teachers and build a $50 million library. Would you do it? Of course you wouldn't. You say that the person before me said, oh, people will never even think about this money later on. Well, those more than a dozen teachers will think about how their jobs were lost. And our town, which is thought to be the, the education town, laying off dozens of teachers while building a, a hugely extravagant library that is on a par with Nassau buildings is ridiculous. The idea also that, um, that this is needed and that the repairs are gonna cost more is really a fiction, I believe, created by the library to justify a $50 million project. I was a library trustee about a decade ago and uh, there we did an extensive public survey about what 
patrons wanted from the library and not a one wanted a new Jones library. People did want a new North Amherst library. And thankfully, thanks to, I understand Hilda Greenbaum, we now have a North Amherst library that's much better. Um, the idea that we can't handle the repairs, well, we would just live within the budget. There's a million dollars for CPA that's already allocated for the $50 million library. If the $50 million library doesn't happen, you have a million dollars in repairs that can just be right there. And when I was a library trustee, we used CPA to redo um, the HVAC system to get it up and running in the special collections area. We did the chimney, we did the part of the roofs, we did part of the windows. A lot, everything that's not the atrium part can be CPA eligible. Even even uh, disability access is is eligible under CPA. Um, it's and, and the idea that the town is going to really spend fifty million dollars to give us a state of the art brand new building equivalent to what is a historic building, that's that's just never going to happen, and it's not needed. You know, when we if you look at uh, when I was a trustee, I was I chaired the buildings committee, I chaired the budget committee, and no one was saying, "Oh my gosh, we have fifty million dollars in repairs." No, we were looking at things little by little. We were putting. I was the JCPC representative from the Jones Library, and we were putting things like the fire board, like things like that, on the 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 JCPC capital plan, the five to ten year capital plan, and this is totally manageable to do these repairs. Uh, I, I think it's really just a fiction created by the library people who want this $50 million library to say somehow the town is going to pay $50 million in, in repairs. That's just not true. Um, just take the million from CPA, reallocate it to everything that's historic, the HVAC, the roof, um, uh, maybe even part of the boiler, I'm not sure. And JCPC, get things back on the schedule. It's time to say goodbye to this project. It's time to keep our teachers for example. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Carol. Okay. So um, I think the next thing that we need to do is to think uh, just for a minute about scheduling another meeting of the Jones Library Building Committee. Um, Ellen, the request is that you come to the JLBC meeting next with, uh, here are some things that we can value engineer. Here's what the cost savings would be in terms of the project. Here's what it would cost in terms of redesign uh, re redesign efforts. Are you, are you okay with that? Yes. Great. Uh, so uh, could we look at scheduling a meeting um, if we can on Thursday, May 30th um, in the afternoon Is there anybody who has a problem with that right now? Paul? Uh, I'm a question mark on that day. George? Uh, yeah, I have a question mark on that day as well, depending on time. Okay. So let's do let's do this. Let's not try to schedule it. Sharon will send out a a, a kind of survey. We'll come up with um we'll come up with a time that seems to work for Work, seems to work for folks. Okay. I want to thank you all. Thank you, Ellen. Thank you, uh, FAA. Thank you from Colliers. Thank you to Bob Parent. Um, thank you for uh, a very good and informative conversation. And we will be in touch about scheduling our next our next meeting. Stay well, everybody. The meeting's adjourned. Thank you all. Thanks. Take care.